We'll go ahead and give it another minute or so and let folks get on the line. All right, let's see where we're at. We got 40 people. Let's see. Just looking for uh, task force members. Appreciate everybody dialing in. All right, it's one after. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Never want to punish the prompt. Uh, thanks everybody for joining. Um, I don't even know what to say. Here we are at 20 meetings. Um, just continue to be so grateful for the time and energy um, of everybody that's committed to participating. Um, certainly the task force individuals themselves, but also from the Eagle team and the support we've received from public sector and others. So really appreciate it. Um, we're going to start uh, by doing some task force business. So we're going to do the roll call um, as a starting point and then um, we'll get on to our pretty busy agenda. So let me get the num names in front of me. Uh, I'm going to start um with uh vice chair mike prusi prusi are you there yes i am madam chair uh from the shores of beautiful cooper lake here in east township oh you're so good you even remember to announce your location thank you for reminding me <laughs> um and our serving as our secretary tanya Pazlowski. hi everyone good afternoon i am joining today from east lansing michigan great thanks tanya and then we'll go alphabetical. So first I've got Chris Bowman. Chris, you with us? Yep, I'm here, Gulliver, Michigan. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, Dave Camps. Yes, I'm here. Hello, everybody. Hancock, Michigan. Great, thanks, Dave. Oh, I like you sporting the Michigan Tech gear. Well done. <laughs> um, all right, Mike Fermanski. Here in Gladstone. Great, hi, Mike. No. Uh, Tom Harrell, he's not been on the last few. Not seeing him. Okay, Jen Hill. I think I got to see I am her here. I'm, I'm in uh, Mar Marquette and I have my camera off so that I can hear you and you can hear me. Thanks, Jen. Douglas Jester. I'm calling in from East Lansing. Great. Thank you, Douglas. Next. We've got Aaron Johnson, who's serving for um, Director Paul Adjiba from MDOT. Good afternoon, Director uh, Aaron Johnson from Degani, Michigan. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Next, we've got uh, Jim Kuchiver. Jim, Good, af Good afternoon, all. Uh, Jim Kuchiver, I'm here calling in today from Eveleth, Minnesota. Aha. Great. I've been to Eveleth. Okay. Um, Michael Larson. Howdy, I'm here, Market, Michigan. Great, thanks, Michael. Uh, Mike Nystrom. I am here in Okemos, Michigan. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Tony Rotowski is next, and Tony told me he wasn't going to be able to be on, but let me just ask if Tony did manage to call in. Okay. I didn't think he was going to be able to join us. Uh, General Rogers. Good afternoon, everybody. Paul Rogers. I'm here from Farmington Hills, Michigan. Great. Thanks to see you. Thanks for joining. Uh, Chairman Scripps. I am here and I am joining from Northport, Michigan. Uh, Roman, are you with us? Absolutely. Yes, I am. Um, Colin from Houghton Portage Township uh, and continuing the, the last meeting's theme, it's actually finally sunny. <laughs> oh, we got clouds now, so we swapped. <clears throat> I'm glad you have sun. Uh, Chris Schwartz. All right, looks like we don't have Chris. And then Tanya Sweener. 
I am calling from um, Key Largo, Florida. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you should have seen Roman's eyes get big. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us while you're in Key Largo. We appreciate that. <laughs> no problem. Just got off an airboat. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, uh, so let's get into our the business that's in front of us. So first, um, you have um, a draft agenda that you received on the 15th. Um, we, and it's also in the chat, um, if you wanna look at it there. Um, we are largely got in front of us today, um, talking a little bit about phase one implementation because that question's come up a couple of times and you all were gracious enough to let me table it last session so that we could focus on recommendations. Uh, so we're gonna spend a little time up front talking about phase one recommendations and um, action. And then we've got the task or the um, version of the, the current version of the report in front of us. So hoping everyone had a chance to spend some time on that. Obviously, we spent a lot of time talking through recommendations last time, um, but want to um, take a look at the public comment that we received and then uh, share with all of you, you know, how we incorporated that, you know, what we thought made sense and just talk through it and get get feedback. Um, and then we've got some public comment at the end. So I'm going to start by seeing if there's a motion to approve the agenda. Mike Nystrom raises his hand. Mike Percy supports. Sounds great. Um, any discussion on the agenda? OK, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great, thank you. Um, and then we will um, look at the meeting minutes from the last meeting. So we should have received those from Kimber on the 14th. Um, so let's move them and see if there's any discussion. Uh, motion for the um, approval of the minutes from the March 3rd meeting. Motion, Mr. Uh, second, Jester. Great. Uh, any discussion on the meeting minutes from the from March? Yeah, my location uh, says Escanaba was actually in Gladstone for right. that meeting. Thank you, Mike. All right, any other discussion? OK, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition to the meeting minutes from March 3rd? OK, great, thank you. OK, so. OK, Kimber's got that. Thanks, Kimber. All right, so before we talk a little bit about phase one, I just felt like it was really necessary to spend a minute recapping um, the work that we have all done together. Um, so many of you are won't be surprised by this, but um, we have had now 20 meetings. Uh, so as you know, Dan and I were saying at the beginning, um, this is going to be a bit of a bummer to wrap it up, but we are coming to our close. Um, so there's 20 meetings that we've had. Um, we were fortunate through phase one to have 10 of those in person. And I think uh, a familiar memory is all of it sort of screeching to a halt last year once we got to the April 2020 meeting. So then we ended up doing um, eight meetings that were either split between the Upper Peninsula and having folks in Lansing or um, doing them all virtual. So, you know, I think that it's been this group has been, I think, quick to adjust to the virtual setup because of um, the fact that you know we'd already been uh, using a little bit of the virtual um, routine before we got to COVID. Um, so that is definitely beneficial. But you know, for those who might be joining here at the end, we were able to have meetings in Marquette and St. Ignace and Hancock and Sault Ste. Marie, Escanaba, um, and up. Uh, uh, which were fantastic meetings. I think it was great to be in person and to have a chance to um, allow the public to not have to always participate remotely and not have to always, you know, do it over a virtual email or um, call in. So um, hopefully we'll all get back to that soon. And I know there were a lot of us who were hoping to be able to wrap this up in person as well. Um, 
but I'm sure we can uh, figure out ways to get together um, after this and keep moving things forward. I thought you would be interested to know that we've received 1128 emails to the in public comments inbox, so um, we've worked hard to um, uh, consolidate those so that you all didn't have to uh, uh, read them all, um, but we certainly have read them all, digested them and worked them into the, the work of um, what we've done. We've had 42 written comments that we've received um, by letter and then frankly close to 100 verbal comments during our in person or online meetings. So, you know, over 1200 different um, unique sets of public comment, which we really appreciate. So before we turn over to the phase one, um, uh, looking at phase one, I do want to mention too, there was some discussion at the last meeting about the work of the Council on Climate Solutions and that will, this work is absolutely an important input into that and to the targets the governor set to 100% economy-wide decarbonization by 2050. Um, I want to suggest to everybody to take a moment to look at uh, michigan.gov slash climate if you haven't already. I know um, some of our task force members already have. Um, and take also take a look at the five work groups that are going to be compiling a lot of the effort that supports the work of the task force and so of the council, excuse me. So there's a work group on um, energy and that's uh, generation, transmission and storage, all things energy as we've been calling it or all things electricity. Um, there's a work group on natural working lands, uh, forestry and ag. So that's one to take a look at. Uh, there's a work group on transportation, a work group on building stock and then a work group on industrial emissions. So um, please uh, take a look at those. I'm sure that we'll be in touch as this all kind of comes together and to make sure that the work that we've done uh, feeds into the work of the Council on Climate Solutions. So, so turning around to look at, oh, sorry, was there a question? Oh, getting a little feedback, sorry. Um, so turning over to look at the phase one implementations. Um, Obviously, we were all part of putting together the first step of the uh, task force to uh, produce the report that came out last year in 2020. Um, and uh, I wanted to mention, of course, that you all received in your inbox um, the last Friday, the Michigan Propane Security Plan. Um, that is a culmination of um, certainly informed by our work and then also um, comes together with work of state agencies. Um, so you'll see a combination there between um, EGLE, of course, a lot of work from the Michigan Public Service Commission, um, MDOT and DTMB as well. Um, so coming out of our um, propane recommendations, there's uh, five points in the plan and then I'm going to hand it over to uh, Chairman Scripps to talk a little bit about it. But I wanted to point out in particular that um, you'll see in the storage piece our recommendations one through four or one through three um, identified around supply infrastructure. You'll see recommendations five through six um, monitoring market conditions and early warning signs of potential disruptions. You'll see in recommendation seven um, addressing high costs of energy in the UP, including recommendations around assistance program and increasing fundings for weatherization. You'll see in seven through twelve. Um, looking at the discussion that we had around using state contracting for propane, you'll see in recommendation 13. Um, and then uh, thinking about uh, ways to support um, uh, uh, customers and making sure that we don't end up in a situation of price gouging, you'll see in recommendation 14. Um, and so with that, I think I'm going to see if I, uh, Chairman Scripps is uh, able to take over and talk a little bit about the five main points in the plan and um, how that all will proceed going forward. But I lost his video, so I'm hoping that that doesn't mean he left us. I am here. Um, I'm having a little bit of computer stuff, so let me know if it breaks up and I will just dial in. But I turned off my video to hope, hopefully preserve the audio. Um, so this was released on Friday. Um, I think it builds the propane security plan. I, I think as as Liesl talked about, it builds on a lot of the discussions we had in phase one uh, around the propane recommendations, uh, as well as some of the recommendations coming out of the propane section of uh, the deep dive that the commission did two years ago as part of the um, statewide energy assessment following the 
the polar vortex in January 2019. Uh, we we conducted a, a, a review of both propane as well as electricity, natural gas, emergency planning, uh, cybersecurity, and physical security that resulted in a, a report that was released in September of 2019. Uh, and then there have been a number of folks across state government, uh, including the different agencies identified in the phase one report, who have been working to try and get a bit more granular uh, and operationalize some of the recommendations. Um, and that includes the folks from DTMB on uh, procurement, DHHS on assistance, um, Eagle, of course, with their, their energy scope, the Department of Transportation on, on rail, uh, and the Public Service Commission, uh, among others. And I just want to run through this fairly quickly at sort of a high level, um, because I think when you look at the plan and look, I, I understand that this sort of gets mixed up in in other issues as well in terms of sort of the future of line five and the state's actions on this. But I think similar to what we tried to do in phase one, which was what do we do in the event of a disruption, regardless of the cause of the disruption? I think this was designed to answer that question. Um, and what what I heard in our discussions, um, both in terms of what the situation looked like before Rapid River was operational, and that we could sort of use that as as a as an asset, as well as what other states uh, have done in order to maintain propane supplies, uh, who aren't as directly connected to to Line Five or, or other sources, it was essentially more storage, more rail, and stronger consumer protections. And when you look at I think the elements of the plan, those are the sort of foundational pieces. So, you know, the the first part is acknowledging that this is a market that is not regulated by the commission for price or uh, or supply, uh, and in fact, instead operates much more like uh, the markets that that we're more used to in other sectors of the economy. It's trying to send strong market signals so that market participants can respond. And I think that we've already seen that in part um, sort of in working with state government and some of the tools that have been added. So um, the sale of Kinchlow from Plains to NGL, uh, I think adds greater diversification of wholesale supply in the UP. And that was assisted with a grant um, to Chippewa County's Economic Development Agency for some of the rail expansion. We've also seen additional rail development, uh, including grant, a grant uh, to, the, to UP Propane to expand track capacity at its Escanaba facility. Uh, and we've heard anecdotal evidence of other uh, retailers who are working to line up alternative supply arrangements uh, and hedging against uncertainty in terms of sort of what long term future looks like. Um, you know, I think that's tied to the second plank, which is basically leveraging everything that we have in state government, including budget and uh, planning facilities. I know that MDOT has been working with a consultant on, uh, this is tied to one of the recommendations in the phase one report on track capacity and, and needed upgrades, as well as a, a number of other planning facilities. Um, and, uh, and I think you see that as well. And then some of what the governor has put in her executive budget recommendation around additional dollars for the uh, rail economic development program. This is one that we identified back in 2019 as, as an opportunity. Um, some dollars for the development of propane storage um, and then uh, some planning uh, grants as well. The third part of the plan is really around the commission's um, energy emergency planning uh, and monitoring function. And that sort of continues the work that we do in partnership with the Propane Gas Association with industry in terms of the shop program that we do on behalf of the Federal Energy Information Administration, uh, as well as sort of the, the sort of regular work that goes into just looking ahead, uh, the, the annual energy assessment or energy appraisal that we do uh, going into each winter in terms of supplies and prices, just trying to get a sense of any um, sort of warning signs on the horizon and being sort of you know battle station ready to to respond if if we see constraints in in supply and these are some of the lessons i think that we've learned and and work to implement since the 2013-14 winter the fourth piece is really customer centric and it's additional assistance dollars um, it, increasing the sort of flexibility on those um, looking at sort of the use of of meat dollars uh, specifically for propane and including on um, we've got a pilot that's ongoing that uh, pairs assistance dollars with flexible payment plans 
for propane uh, customers. And then also essentially going uh, beyond what we have in terms of consumer protection, which really deals only with retail price gouging when it occurs and ultimately adopting something similar to the Wisconsin law that we talked about that would allow us to go upstream. And if there's market manipulation at the wholesale level, be able to get to that as well in terms of protecting customers. And then finally is, is really around maximizing propane efficiency. And I thought one of the, the highlights of the phase one report was talking about working in partnership with the industry around uh, an efficiency program specifically targeted at propane customers. So for high efficiency propane uh, furnaces, high efficiency propane water heaters, and you know, with the legislature passing and the governor signing into law last year, Public Act 332, that creates the Propane Commission in the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development, and then ultimately the decision by the propane industry to levy an assessment on sales in order to fund a, a program that can assist with, with efficiency. I think that's uh, that's a good step in the right direction. So I will say there's, there's obviously been a fair amount of um, dialogue, maybe the polite way of saying it, uh, around this plan since it was released on Friday. I'll say that I don't actually believe that the substance of the plan is all that controversial. I think it builds off the recommendations from this group, from our work uh, with the statewide energy assessment. I think there's obviously a larger discussion that's implicated in some of this. And again, I'll say this isn't a recommendation on what should be the future of the line. It is if there is a disruption, how do we make sure that that folks in the UP have access to the propane supplies that they need in order to stay warm and uh, and also on assistance programs uh, and, and consumer protections to make sure that they're paying reasonable prices? And I, I will say I think that this plan is, is a significant step in that direction uh, and builds off a lot of what I have heard and I think what we've heard from some of the experts who are, are really close to the industry. Um, so I, I wanted to provide that as as an update in terms of, of what it is. I, I, you know, I'm not naive to think that this gets released in a vacuum, uh, but I think when you look at the substance of the plan, it reflects what we've talked about and I think is a good starting point uh, for how to meet meet the needs of, of Upper Peninsula residents um, sort of going into next winter and, and beyond. Thank you, Dan. Are there questions? OK, Nystrom's raising his physical hand. I'm going to also say that people might want to use the hand raise feature in case I don't have your video up. Mike. <clears throat> Madam Chair, uh, Dan, I, I, I thought this was very poorly timed. I have to say, and I think that the two of you have access back to the governor's office. I, I think Dan hit on it pretty well that the, the governor's office could have leaned on our recommendations more, the work that the, the commission had done prior to this, this uh, group coming together. I, I saw that come out in my email and I was baffled by it. I, I honestly think a message has to go back to the governor that the, there's a lot of political heat that's being taken over it because the timing was so poor. Um, the, it seems as though it's it's political in nature because of all of the uh, debate that is going on regarding line five, but also all the work. Uh, Madam Chair, you opened up the meeting that we've had 20 meetings and none of that came out in in the release. None of it said that it was based on recommendations from this huge group of folks who have given all of this time and effort and input. Uh, to do this. Uh, quite frankly, it seems as though uh, our 20 meetings was a waste of time based on the fact that they put it out there and didn't even refer to all the work that we've done here. And so I, I was baffled by it and let down by the governor's office. Uh, I think that they could have gotten a lot more traction with it had they referred to uh, all of the recommendations that we had done and maybe waited a week or so until our final report actually does come out so that it kind of plays off each other. I, I, I was very let down by it, quite frankly. And, and I agree with Dan. I think uh, all of the good work is in there, but it seems as though it was ideas somehow that the governor pulled out of the air, and that just isn't the case. I think it could have been done a lot better. So I, I hear that, Mike, um, and I, I think there's a certain element of this that, I mean, 
I, I think you're you're gonna it, it, there's a lot in the ether around this right there's a, a broader context surrounding this discussion um and i think some of it is you know had she has she waited it's why didn't you put it out sooner and and so i but i hear i hear what you're saying i, I will note that that the UP task force is is noted in terms of one of the inputs as there are essentially three things, including the C, the UP task force, and then this sort of cross agency work group that are noted on on the first page, including sort of a, a link to the phase one report on propane and 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 the fact that we were working to finish up our work on the essentially everything else um, here shortly. I, I and we probably could have included sort of you know, this reflects recommendation X from the phase one report or from the C report or whatever, just to to make sure that we did that it was tied back. Um, but I, I think when you look at the substance of the report and the the recommendations from the phase one report and then what's included in the in the propane security plan, I, there's there's in my mind, and maybe it's because I'm too close to it, but but a fair amount of pretty clear linkages between what this group has recommended and what ultimately showed up in the plan. I, I agree with you, Dan. I, I guess my point is, is it almost came across as though it was the the recommendations were developed by um, uh, a team of departmental staffers, is how it came across, rather than this this cross section of experts that we have on this this uh, authority or whatever uh, work group. It just didn't come across that way, and I think it could have. Is 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 my big point here, and yet we're in our twentieth of twenty meetings. If it had been another week, uh, I, the, what were we worried about? The ice storm last night. We had to roll it out. I, I really didn't understand why it couldn't wait until our report was final. Uh, use the work group as uh, a little bit of the backbone of why you're making the recommendations. I think that, Dan, you and a whole bunch of people on this call right here, and I have been around a long time to know that if it seems as though it came from your departmental staff, it's going to seem a little more political in nature. If it comes from a work group that's a cross section of experts, a cross section of political uh, affiliations, I think it comes across a whole lot better. Is is my main point, and it's too late now. It's out there. I think our our uh, our release of our report is going to go out there. Hate to say it, uh, excuse my phrase, but like a popcorn fart. Okay, it's out there. Great job. Twenty meetings of work. Uh, it's it's done now. I, I just don't, I think the timing was just very poor. I hear that. Um, I guess my comment would be that, you know, there's a lot of um, stuff that lives in the comms world that's kind of outside of our world. Um, as you could tell from my introductory comments, like there are absolute linkages that are very clear from our recommendations. And so um, I don't know. I think, um, you know, I, I um, am very aware that it's linked directly to the propane um, report that we did of our phase one. So, I, you know, in my mind, you wait a few more weeks and then all of a sudden it's lost in the middle of what else we're releasing because now we're looking at the full UP. So, I mean, I just, you know, I think you can, I think you can um, always look at, you know, from a communication side, I'm happy to say that's not my world, you know, as to what's the right path to, you know, get some of those messages out there. I'm going to, I'm just going to let that go and know that it's grounded in the work that we've done together and, um, you know, it's been a lot of a lot of heavy lifting here amongst the team and i think you know not only do we all know that but we've had you know over a hundred uh participants almost at every single meeting along taking this journey with us and they all know it too and um you know maybe in the future i'll pick up some uh spare time do some comms work in the in in my spare time but like right now i'm really focused on making sure that we're executing what we've been tasked with so i hear what you're saying but that's what I, my focus i agree is. with you uh director I, we've done some great work here and i think that that is uh part of the impetus of my point we've done some great work they should have used us i'm done with it though we're good 
other task force members who have comments want to discuss? OK, I'm not seeing any hands go up. Just going to wait a second before we move forward with our agenda. OK, happy to pick this back up um, as necessary. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the comments, Mike. Thanks for the presentation, Dan. I think that sets us up well. OK, now we're moving on right on time to our task force work se se session. Excuse me. Um, so again, we have received uh, lots of public comment directly related to the phase two recommendations. We've got uh, 24 sets of public comments. You've seen you task force members have received them in a series of emails. We tried to get them to you as quickly as things were coming in so that you were able to kind of keep up with what we were doing. Um, we have parsed through uh, those comments and we've worked uh, leaned heavily on our colleagues at public sector consultants. Um, who's been helping us uh, fit this all in and have been um, carrying a big piece of um, consolidating all that you are sharing into what is the phase two report. Um, so both Eric Pardini and Julie Meddy Bennett have been a really big asset in this, as you all know from the last few meetings. Um, we have worked through what we saw in public comment and then um, we took a shot at incorporating it. Um, based on what we thought made sense uh, from all of our time together um, talking. So what we're going to do is I'm going to actually hand it off to Eric um, to take us through um, all together what has been incorporated of the comments that we've received on um, the phase two uh, recommendations. And then what I'm going to ask is that you um, use the raise hand feature uh, as we talk through the edits. Um, if you've got comments or discussion points that you want to review. Um, now, remember, we spent a decent amount of time at the last meeting working through the recommendations, so hopefully um, anything else that you had seen, you've raised at this point. So I'm hoping that we're really narrowing down the differences um, so that we have a final work product here at the end of the meeting today. So with that, I'm going to invite Eric uh, to join us and um, take it away from there. Great. Thank you, Director Clark. I'm going to share screen uh, for the task force so we can review the recommendations um, in the updated draft of the report. So this will look very similar to the previous versions. Um, we, we did share the full list of recommendations that had incorporated your feedback from our March 3rd meeting for public comment. Uh, Kimber and team from Eagle have disseminated all of those comments. I have those up on a separate screen if we do want to circle back to any of those comments that you you wanted to reflect um, in this report. But I've gone, I went through the effort of determining which public comments uh, sought to advance the recommendations as they were formed in the report. Uh, we did not incorporate sort of direct disagreements or other asides uh, as they weren't germane to the report itself, but happy to consider anything the task force uh, saw from public comment that needs to be reflected. So a few general revisions that were sort of stemming out of our last meeting uh, to the report body itself uh, suggested change from Roman about the definition for energy justice, which is reflected in this version. Uh, this reflects the uh, work that he and other colleagues have done to define this topic and I think provides a more expansive definition. I'm happy to pause uh, if folks want to read this way in, but other, otherwise I'll keep moving on if I don't see sort of comments or uh, hear you come off mute with questions. Okay. So the next change was uh, stemming from the discussion that happened at the March 3rd meeting about the cost, average cost of industrial prices in the UP. We've added just a few sentences here um, in this section to reflect uh, sort of the nature of the electric supply rates for uh, mostly mining and paper mills uh, as a driver for why average prices in the industrial sector can be uh, much lower uh, and reflecting the fact that they rely on real-time pricing uh, to uh, determine their, their operations. So are there other any comments on this clarifying language here? Yes, go ahead. Maybe that was just a not a direct comment. OK. Keep going. Just one more change that we want to reflect. Uh, it comes a little bit later. So 
first comment that is reflected in this is came from Brad Newman, um, and this was a this was reflecting how the recommendation 13 deals with grant support that Eagle can provide to communities. And the comment was that we should incorporate other partners um, and statewide organizations that can help with this training and with advancing the goals. Uh, in our in our mind, this reflected the conversation and feedback that task force had also provided. Um, and I think makes a meaningful advance to recommendation 13 and therefore uh, we've suggested for inclusion uh, the additional sentence that's highlighted. So any discussion on the inclusion of this public comment as a revision to the report? This is Michael Larson. I think that's I think it's an appropriate addition. Great. All right. Hearing no other comments, I'm going to mark this as resolved and we'll incorporate that into the final report. Uh, keeping going, another theme from Michael, uh, from Brad Newman, uh, reflecting. He's an awful uh, man. Uh, uh, reflecting the desire to have regional planning uh, entities incorporated in this effort to in, uh, inventory brownfields, post industrial sites, and marginal state lands. The original suggestion was to uh, broaden this to incorporate all of the regional planning entities uh, through our discussion uh, we we determined that it's probably appropriate to have a peer agency uh, with the dnr and eagle uh, so that would be the agency that houses the regional planning entity and planning entities themselves so bringing in medc to support this effort uh, to bridge uh, the role for planning entities and i think this reflects uh, an earlier change that was made from our march 3rd discussion which brought the regional planning entities into other uh, efforts around really maximizing the impact that both grant fundings can have and collaborative planning processes can have for the Upper Peninsula. Any comments uh, on the inclusion of the Michigan Economic Development Corporation as a partner in this effort? Eric, I'm just going to jump in and hope that um, we hear from others if they um, have thoughts. I thought this was a really good addition and appreciated Brad bringing it up. Um, we had articulated um, uh, or we could have articulated different counties or different EDCs too, but I just think it makes sense um, from an Eagle perspective to make sure that the departments are coordinating. So, um, yeah, I liked it. All right, any other comments on this? All right, seeing none marking as resolved. Uh, the next public comment came from Jen Dennis at SEMCO. Uh, this was uh, the desire to have the planning efforts around uh, energy opportunities more broadly reflect uh, other forms of advanced energy solutions or energy more efficient energy solutions. So we have broadened this from uh, identify potential siting options for renewable energy to identify potential siting options for energy development, including renewables, combined heat and power, and other advanced energy technologies to cover the potential inclusion of fuel cells or other um, aspects. So not just on renewables, but sort of a broad host of where these potential siting opportunities may arise. Any discussion, comment on the broadening of the energy siting um, effort under recommendation 14? All right, I'm going to keep going. So this is the other section that I had mentioned that we had added. This is not a change to the recommendations itself. This is more uh, bringing in the context within the renewable energy section of the report to discuss uh, the role of distributed generation, since that did have a good amount of comments uh, about that topic during our uh, task force discussions. We thought it was necessary um, and based on task force feedback to reflect the extent of distributed generation programs in the Upper Peninsula. So we've provided here an update that the M from the MPSC's uh, program reports, talking about the current uh, the current caps and the current participation rates, as well as information about uh, both current and ongoing efforts to uh, potentially change the change the distributed generation structure. So there's we're referencing in response to Michigan Senate resolution. The MPSC through the My Power Grid has an ongoing uh, distributed energy resources rate design work group that there's proposed legislation in the Michigan House of Representatives to change program participation caps. 
and uh, other co um, complicating uh, uh, developments out of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission through their order 2022-22, which would potentially impact uh, the state's generation, distributed generation program. So this just broadens the discussion of uh, renewables to reflect the task force uh, focus on this throughout. Any comments on the inclusion of more discussion related to this topic? Uh, this is Jen Hill. Is is it necessary to or um? I see it. Okay, it is there. Sorry, I'm trying to read on a tiny screen. Or um, but yes, ah, there we. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, but the 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 um the my power grid I think is doing a lot of really good work in it, and it's um, it's there and. Uh, yeah, this is a really important topic that's ongoing, and I'm really glad we've expanded it. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jen. Any other comments on this, this inclusion of this section? All right, marking as resolved. And I think just one more up. Oh, yep, one more change. Sorry, we are comment. My comments kind of skipped around. Um, so this is another comment from Brad Newman, uh, who suggested that. In addition to renewable energy siting being a potential issue that communities face, there's also concerns about electric vehicle infrastructure development and the siting and planning considerations that go into that. Uh, we have a separate electric vehicle recommendation, which largely focuses on deployment strategies. However, because this recommendation six is, uh, is mainly focused on the planning portion of that, we thought that the suggestion of incorporating electric vehicles along with renewable energy uh, made sense and reflected the work that the task force had put in um, thus far. Any comments on incorporating electric vehicle infrastructure in a planning effort? Okay. Um, Jen, this is um, another comment that I, the group had brought up about the current deployment of electric vehicle charging stations in the UP. Uh, we did actually a lot of digging uh, in between the last meeting and even yesterday to try and figure out if this number could po could possibly be correct. Uh, we know that Eagle through the Charge Michigan Charge Up Michigan program has done uh, fast charge station deployments. Uh, however, only one of those in operation is in the UP. Uh, we also reviewed data from other tools like PlugShare. Uh, which provide an overview of charging systems. And after I sorted out for um, sort of the home type of outlets, the standard type of outlets that can potentially be used for charging, you end up with uh, numbers that corroborate the DOE, uh, the DOE information. So in lieu of another alternative source that brings this number up, this is the best available information that I was able to find uh, reflecting current charging stations. Um, you know, and I know Jen, we had just communicated just this morning about, uh, you know, whether or not we could we could find something better. But is there any thoughts, worries about including this uh, as it is? From the I want to say a thank you to Eric for chasing um, all the different directions we sent, because I think a lot of us were like, what? Um, <laughs> and Eric was um, really diligent in uh, checking this, and it looks like DOE has the right numbers. Other that thoughts? Very surprising still, you're right. Yeah, thank you, Eric. I um, I also wanna echo that. Um, we have a lot of work to do. Opportunity, opportunity. All right, seeing no other comments on that. Uh, that's it. Those are all the changes that have been made in this report. So as you can see, they do not reflect all of the comments um, that were the public comments that were received between the 3rd and the 14th. So now I open it up to the task force for other suggestions um, or final comments on this document as it lives. So I just want to say again a huge thank you to Eric uh, for moving quickly and nimbly uh, to analyze those comments as they came in. We've talked a few times about what we thought made sense to incorporate. Um, so task force members, um, did you see public comments um, that you wanted to see incorporated that we didn't include here? Um, or were there other other discussion points that task force members uh, want to bring up around um, the part two report?
I'm going to recommend we use raise hands or go ahead and take yourself off mute, particularly if anybody's on the phone. I have a question on recommendation number one. This is Jen. And could you blow it up, please? Yep. Thanks. So I want to note um, there was some concern um, among um, non-regulated utilities um, at the original language and recommendation one. And I, I um, want to applaud the um, the change. I don't know if it, this is a change or not, but I, the draft I have, you know, doesn't have encourage. And we came to that, I believe, at the last meeting. So I, I just want to really call that out. Um, I think there's a lot to be gained in this tremendous transition that we have for us to figure out ways to find efficiencies working together does not mean that we are giving up any kind of control, but I do think there's a lot to be gained in um, some of this stuff is we're going to have to buy it. And how could we leverage um, in particular uh, working together? And I know there's already groups that work together in the UP, but is there more that could be done uh, to help leverage that? So thank you. Thanks for the comments, Jen. Um, I do think that you're um, touching on a good point that we heard from many people on the task force as well as in the public comments is that um, because of the breadth and the difference um, of the electric providers in the Upper Peninsula, it's a, it's a different challenge. It's a, it's a, it's unique. So, um, and nobody knows that better than Mike. And I saw Mike had his hand up. So Mike Fermansky. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess it's just uh, overall, um, thought here, you know, going back to, um, you know, the original uh, charge of this group and, um, you know, this is the 20th meeting and I think back to the first meeting when, um, you know, Tom Harrell mentioned, you know, about looking at the IOUs and that this uh, UP doesn't present a great, um, you know, a customer profile for them with, you know, you know, very few customers per mile and um, stuff. And just it, it made me think about, you know, the, the comments we've gotten um you know from from the public and um you know comments related to rates it seemed like they're all i don't know vast majority if not all are related to upco and you know i i don't see anybody com you know complaining about you know cloverland or any of the munis or anything like that it's like all all the you know cost-based complaints are about upco and you know we we had that um uh you know, we, we got that press release sent to us uh, a couple months ago about, you know, the potential sale to the Axiom infrastructure. And I know some of the comments we'd heard about UPCO is, you know, the fact that they were foreign owned and this Axiom seems like they're, I, I'm not quite sure from reading, you know, the, the if they're from New York or from Canada, um, it seems like they got locations in each, but I, I, I don't know how we would, you know, a big picture tied together. You know, what Tom Harrell said made, made a lot of sense that, you know, it seemed like UP is more set up, you know, for, for the co-op type of, um, you know, business plan. So, you know, if they're for sale and there's already co-ops here, it seemed like, you know, we could somehow, I don't know, encourage, um, you know, making a co-op at UPCO or, or sell it off to the existing co-ops or munis or where just, you know, then, then it brings it back to local control. It's not based out of London. It's not based out of New York. Um, presumably costs, you know, could, could come down from where they are now. I, I, but I just, I don't know how to tie that into one succinct uh, recommendation. It's just, just some, you know, big picture thoughts I've been having here in the last couple of months. I wanted to, um, I don't know, just get them out there. Jen, are you jumping in? Uh, yeah, I um, I want to applaud Mike on his big thinking. Um, as a, I'm here as a, a member of the board of the Citizens Utility Board of Michigan, which advocates for residential ratepayers in the in the uh, Public Service Commission process. So um, 
and I did also certainly when you sit back and you get a chance to read all the comments as we have, uh, and thank you to whoever put that word document together. It's so nice to read um, that. Yeah, the customer complaints were the number one issue on rates. Um, I think it's a big ask to make suggestions um, right now <laughs> on um, how we will address these rates, but um, are there particular places, Eric, where rates are highlighted in the document that we could maybe reflect on? So that, I was thinking about that when Mike was talking. The main place where rates come up is in the section enhance uh, rate design options. And so there is a recommendation around, there's a time-based, there's a time-based rate recommendation. And there's one more, there's one more around the rate structure and a review for, and I'm trying to remember where exactly that landed. Is that in this section? Yeah, so this would be recommendation nine. And so this is the MPSC should examine cost drivers and cost allocation for UP investor owned utilities with the greatest disparity between rate classes. And that goes on from there. So I will say the other thing that comes to mind for me is a question that we all have talked about a couple of times in these last few meetings, which is these are recommendations. How does it live beyond the task force, right? And so in my mind, one of the benefits of a planning discussion for that is peninsula wide is that there's an ability to have some of the communications components across um, across the you know the UP continue on um, because the benefit of a discussion that is region wide around electricity planning is that this carries forth because to Mike's point, you know, Upco is going through a bit of a transition and so there might be an ability to have a different discussion, you know, in six months, 12 months than there is, you know, today on March 16th. And, you know, the task force won't be around at that point. You know, we won't be able to have that conversation in this formal context. But if there is a, uh, even, even an informal region-wide electric discussion that creates another, body to have that conversation, but I don't know what others think about that. I see Dave Camp's hand up. Dave? Yeah, I like the uh, discussion here regarding time of use rates and, and what that can, how that can impact pricing you know, with UPCO or whoever it may be, you, know, you can capitalize on on things that you can, where you can use the electricity when it's at a um, low rate versus a high rate, you know, just through, but that's going to take some evolution of the of the grid a little bit to get to that point, but it's it's uh, it's one approach to, to, to those prices, uh, getting control of those prices. The other thing that I've seen a lot of is catalyst Catalyst communities, and uh, you know, there's there's a lot of issues about the changes coming. You know, there's there's pain that's involved in that, but yet it's a, it's a very exciting time to look at this. There's there's so much value in some of these changes that can be implemented. I think the the if we focused on the value that these changes can bring to the consumer. Um, that that's going to catalyze this this turnover and affect the munis and, and the co-ops to come on board with that kind of thing. So uh, I just I think that basing these these implementations on these, even though we're just making recommendations, that if they were focused on value that we can extract out of those changes, that's going to drive a lot of change and uh, bring out the exciting part of that to the consumer. That's all I got. I think that's a really good point, Dave. So, Mike, do you feel comfortable with what's incorporated here, or do you want to? Are you suggesting that we add a recommendation? 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it seems like I don't know. I, I don't know how you. I, I guess yeah. They're just recommendations. So yeah, I guess you know where it goes from there. Uh, who knows? But I mean that I don't know that seems seems to be the problem when people talk about you know people complain about you know power in the up it's a lot of time you know yeah there's other things but it seems like generally it's you know residential rates for upco and so it seems like we should you know if if that's if that's the the biggest issue we should you know try and make a recommendation to solve that or fix that or change that or whatever where I'm struggling a little bit is just because the UPCO transition is in process right now. And so it's not clear to me what, it's not clear to me how to craft a recommendation that leads to an outcome to impact that because they're going through that sale right now. So it, to me, it's a little bit up in the air right now, but I guess I, I'm very open to what others think. Tanya's got her hand up. I just want to share, Lisa, I agree with what you said about just the key um, piece about the coordination among the providers in the UP. And then if that was an option and there were co-ops or munis that wanted to get together and buy UPCO, that that would have been a forum for that discussion to come to bear. Um, so appreciate everything that Mike is saying, but it, it, it just highlights for me how important that first recommendation is, even though, as we've all noted, difficult to force anything to happen. It probably requires some leaders among the companies, <coughs> Fermansky, to bring people together <laughs> and try to get those conversations started, is my thought. Um, and then if I just a couple of other things, one, I want to echo the kudos to Eric and Julie for taking this massive amount of information and pulling this into just a well structured and um, I think did a good job of capturing the things that we talked about, even though they were sort of all over the place when you both came in. So um, I want to thank you for that work. And then there was just one more comment that I saw that I don't think we can do anything about at this point, but wanted to acknowledge. And that was um, Jen Dennis also pointed to that there wasn't a lot addressing natural gas in the report. And I know we do talk about that it's up there and give some general overview of its existence, but I don't know that it has gotten the type of evaluation of, okay, what does it mean in relation to the other recommendations that we've made, right? We have a lot on propane, we have a lot on electricity, and natural gas probably did get uh, not quite the attention or context that would have been valuable, though I understand we can't kind of wholesale <laughs> create adding that in at this point. But I just wanted to acknowledge um, that she had made that point and I, I agree that there is validity to that. So thank so you everyone. For I hear what you're saying on that. I will say yeah. that, you know, Semco presented in phase one and we yeah. did spend a lot of time on discussing pipelines, both propane and natural gas in phase one. Um, so I, you know, maybe there's some, um, output that you know merges the two together and you know just by nature of there being a variety of different energy sources you know x amount of time um it is tougher to meld it all together but again maybe that's a reason for the recommendation one right to put all the pieces together but um anyway um so i, I hear what you're saying i guess um i reflected on that a bit too and felt like you know there was um Maybe maybe we should have pulled out a little bit more continuity from phase one to phase two, but I, I do we did spend time on it in phase one as well. So did I see Dan's hand up? If I can find my mute button. Yeah. Um so I think I, I remember that we had um on this point, expanding access to natural gas service was 
did come up in the as a recommendation when we were sort of brainstorming under the buckets. But I think when we started voting on it, it got sort of significantly fewer votes than I can't remember how many votes it it got. But and Eric, maybe you can ask. I remember it was there, but I know it didn't sort of get the threshold of 10 votes to be included further. And I think it was maybe seen as a so I, I don't disagree with the idea that that we that there's still more to do. And I, I think the fact that we've got however many recommendations we ended up with, you know, 16 or whatever versus the 50 some I think that we came up with in our brainstorming function. I think some of this is just a reflection of sort of what rose to the top through the through the voting process. Um, on the point that Mike raised, I, this was one of the recommend or this is one of the takeaways I, I pulled out of the last meeting too, and that that there's stuff on rates and costs in the report, certainly, and recommendation nine is is one that we have in terms of the IOUs and and between rate classes. But I I do I do take the comment that you know if if you ask the average UPER sort of the biggest challenge be like we pay an awful lot for electricity. And um, I just I think there's a lot here where we get at that in terms of assistance for those who are most exposed in terms of, you know, sort of long term drivers that that may help. Um, I think the planning function can help. But I there isn't sort of any one thing I'll, I'll say on the specifics of the UP acquisition. I can't talk much about that, but um, but I I do. That is the one part where I sort of as we're wrapping this up. Um, I think it shows up in a bunch of places that I hope sort of taken together with action in the next couple of years sort of get at some of the those biggest challenges. Um, but it's, you know, it, I don't know that you could come up with, <laughs> with a recommendation that's, you know, lower the lower the damn rates or whatever, you know, just it, it cost it costs too much. And and yet I think, you know, that is clearly what we've heard. I think I think we reflect that broader concern in a number of places in the report with specifics to work on um, that that my hope is that they they add up to sort of a real solution. And it looks like Mike wants to respond, so I'd love to hear what he has to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just um, looking at, you know, the, a lot of these are just recommendations, encouraging stuff like that. So, you know, maybe I maybe I would like to um, see a recommendation that, you know, administration encourage, you know, all the UP energy providers, you know, munis, co-ops, UPCO get together and, and, you know, see if there is a path to, um, you know, getting local ownership, um, you know, to, you know, to the UP based utilities have local ownership. That didn't really roll off the tongue, but <laughs> if someone could wordsmith that, please. Well, I'm pulling up recommendation one and just looking at that again. I, I, um, I guess I, I, I continue to struggle a little bit with going all the way to local ownership because there's just so much that goes into it. But I, I tell me what others think. Tanya. I'll just share. I think that's I guess I'm, I, I have an adverse reaction to that suggestion and I'm trying to figure out exactly what it is. I mean, I think partly the administration telling, you know, a group of companies to think about buying another company just seems like not a great role um, for the administration to be in um, and government telling right like the idea of government telling the people in the UP to plan together seemed you know sort of out of the realm of possibility but telling them to get together and buy another company that just seems even further outside of what's possible and that getting people to plan together and sit down and even communicate with each other seems like it would be even more important and I guess the other piece is there's no guarantee that fixes the problem, right? There's certainly rate making um, 
different types of rate making that can be applied to determine exactly what rates will be. But just because someone else owns it, whether it's, you know, another company or a group of local owners doesn't necessarily mean that fixes the problem either, right? There is a cost structure that's being addressed and you have, you know, regulatory oversight over those rates already. So it isn't like they're just, they can make the rates whatever they like. So that was um, inelegant as well, but th that's just my reaction to that. I, I don't think I would support that as a recommendation. Dave Camps. I agree with Tanya and um, and and Director Clark on the, you know, look, they're going through a change. I work with UPCO a lot, and uh, it seems like they're becoming a new company. And and like Semco, uh, you know, Semco embraced EWR, and they're like they don't need any attention really from us. A couple of those points were really good that they made in that uh, comment, but uh, Semco's, um, you know, they're on autopilot pretty much. You know, they seem to be doing pretty well, and I think UPCO's headed that way. They're after working with them, I think they're going to make some changes that come come our way, and we have to wait and see what they can do, and then we could have that discussion. I'll gladly be a part of that discussion. Thanks. I'm going to say that this discussion right now is one of the reasons that I'm bummed this is our last meeting, because I think that these are important discussions, and I think they're um, being had by really well-informed individuals with different perspectives, and so I, I think it's adding overall to the to the work that we're doing. Other comments on that point? Yeah, Jen. Director Clark, um, I completely I completely agree with you on that last point that uh, we're getting to the meat of it here at the end, and. The um, the other part of this is that I was in a meeting. You know, my other hat. I was a um, at the Michigan Municipal League uh, Capital Conference this morning, and the amount of money that we're going to get into our communities is significant. And this is only the first bunch of money coming from the federal government. So there's also a lot of opportunities, particularly with those municipal utilities that have not had access to funds in a very long time. Um, literally in the next 60 to 90 days, we're gonna get millions of dollars and there's a lot of infrastructure to work to be done. It's right now directed towards water, sewer and broadband, but there are other funds coming and it may free up funds to be put to other uses. So in the spirit of that, there's a lot of opportunity in front of us that we haven't had before. I think, um, I hear Tanya's point that there's no guarantee that the rates change with local ownership. At the same time, I certainly value the co-op model and municipal uh, model. Um, of course, it would, <laughs> but uh, we would have to show that we work together to move these things forward at the same time. And, and, and so I'm hoping that, yes, we can absolutely find a way to continue this going forward. And I would be glad to help work towards that. I, I'm not sure where I'm headed with this. But aside from saying that I completely agree that we absolutely need to keep these kinds of conversations going and that there's going to be money on the table we've never had before that may allow for opportunities we um, uh, that will allow this transition to happen as quickly as we want it to. The other thing I think I'm hearing, Jen, is, and I'm hearing from Tanya and Dave as well, is that um, we're all recognizing uh, in Mike's comments, we're all connecting with those comments, right? So what Mike is pulling out, you know, is certainly something that we heard in presentations, that we heard in public discussion, et cetera. Um, it's just whether that can be distilled down into a recommendation at this point. Um, that's where I think people are feeling like maybe we're not, maybe the timeline isn't quite there. It's not that, you know, this group might not be quite there, but it's the timeline might not be quite there because there are some threads that are going to uh, continue out past the end date of this task force and the recommendations. Um, and I, you know, I do appreciate your comments, Jen, about, you know, if there are additional 
dollars in communities, is there a way for munis in particular, but you know, others more broadly to be able to think about, you know, how do those help shape the energy road in front of us um, to make things better, you know, on the ground for resident Ubers? I don't Can know if I distilled what you said about, or not. Yes, that I, I uh, thank you. Um, do we want to put in in the beginning where we do where we set the stage? Maybe mention how the comments um, were tended to focus on um, on the cost issue and the issue up, issue of Upco. We could uh, maybe yeah. su summarize that. That would be a way of making sure it's right there at the front of the report. I think that's a really good point. And I, yeah, um, Eric, I'm I'm furiously searching. I don't know if you can find something quickly, but we can. Yeah, there's stuff in here in rates. Um, but, you know, I, I do, I think it's a great point, which is that, you know, the thing we heard over and over and frankly, you know, what you all have been hearing over and over for years is that attention needs to be paid in order to um, take any steps possible to make sure we're keeping downward pressure on rates. Yeah, and it starts on page seven and I can pull the screen share back up. Um, if folks want to review what's currently in there and maybe we can live update it. So this is there are and there are additional places where we address the topic of rates and the introduction in the energy uh, energy and environmental justice section and in the rate design and affordability section. We do talk a little bit in deeper context about the rates, but here's where we frame up the overall um, price comparisons and differentials between industrial, um, commercial, and, and residential rates. We do highlight the high rates for certain utilities in this in this portion we do provide comparison um you know we can we can certainly amplify here uh the other places where we could potentially address this would be um as we talk about electric rate equity where we definitely put a finer point on the challenge of up energy rates or electricity rates Uh, this this is Douglas Jester. Um, Eric, I am not seeing uh, your uh, presentation of the text, and I, I don't know whether others are or not. Is it a, I know Teams is was having a sharing problem. I'm, I was seeing it. I was seeing it, and then it okay. disappeared. No, I just tried to restart the share. Did that, did that work for you, Douglas? It did not. So apparently it's not immediately solvable. Let's not waste time on it then. Um, I, because I was wanting to look at the part where uh, we have the discussion of the rates not being uniformly high and suggest that perhaps what's being suggested is to more specifically call out UPCO. Um, and there are a few other um, non-investor-owned utilities that have high rates as well. But yeah, right in that bottom, section. I think it's the bottom of um, page seven, Eric. If I don't know which version I've got, but. Right. And then uh, just I don't think this calls for any revision of the report, but uh, in addition to thinking about rates, I wanted to point out that there are high fixed costs of distributing power in the UP that would be diluted by increased sales to um, distribution customers, not increased sales to, you know, in mills and mines, but but increased sales to distribution co customers that would arise out of the electrification recommendations. So in the long run, um, there is, if we can find a way to make that transition, there is a way to reduce rates fairly materially um, by electrifying. Yep, thank you, Douglas. Um, I can um, so on in that page seven area. Could yeah. we 
include, I'm thinking more specifically that the addressing the, the, um, the point specifically being that the, the number of comments we received most concerned the rates. That's sorry. Backwards. Yep, that makes sense, that's, Jen. Yeah, yep. that's what I'm. So, so that we're calling out, um, so that folks understand that we've read what we've seen and we're incorporating it. Yeah. And okay, we've got some hands up. Um, I actually think Tanya was first, and then Roman, then Mike. I think that it may, thank you, that it may be addressed here. I was anticipating the suggestion was that we go back in here and say UPCO's rates are too high, but I think the way that it's framed here is actually well done because we just looked at the chart, right, where there are residential rates that are higher than UPCO, so it would seem unfair to call them out and not refer to others that have rates higher. So I think it's framed well, assuming that what is in that introductory paragraph works for everyone. I like it, though. I think it addresses it well. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Tanya. OK, um, Roman. Roman, we can't hear you, so if you're talking, you might be on mute. I am. I was talking. Somehow I double clicked and I remuted myself. We've all been there. Um, I do it every day. Um, so um, the suggestion that Douglas had, um, I think it can be um, articulated in this um, in, in this recommendations, because why not? I mean, that is a problem and it's it is a forward thinking. There would be a forward thinking on our part if we are calling for um, renewables and for other. Uh, say distributive uh, generation pro proliferation um, and resulting in greater electrification, we will be dealing with those kind of issues. So um, perhaps a comment um, in line of what Douglas suggested would be appropriate for uh, these recommendations. Um, so that's one and two. Um, and again, this is going to <laughs> the uncomfortable um, uh, conversation about the change of ownership um, of UPCO. Um, and um, Douglas, again, would be probably the expert, and I hope that Commissioner Scripps is doing this right now, um, since it is an ongoing matter. So, but um, isn't, um, aren't situations like this, when there is a change of ownership, also an opportunity to, um, in one way or another, commit a utility to um, essentially rethinking their rates and um, essentially a rate uh, reduction, cost reduction, overall reduction. And if yes, so does this need to go into the report or recommendations? Um, this, this is Douglas. I'm 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 going to um, decline to comment on that because I'm doing work for a party in the case. And I'm going to decline to comment on that <laughs> because I'm going to review the case. <laughs> Somebody else then. I don't know if I have a comment. I'm processing. Um, Let's go. We've got we've got a mic and a mic hand up and let's go and see if either of them are commenting on that or if they had other issues to raise. Uh, Mike Nystrom. So my comment was going to be very generic. I've listened to the conversation. I've been sitting here reading a lot of what was put up and I'm fine with the change that was suggested to to change uh, the page that we're on right now. I think that we all have to remember that when you put together a report that's filled with uh, recommendations, when you do this, you want it to be a, a living document that is probably, I think that the uh, director touched on it in her original comments when the point was brought up. I think you want these, uh, these reports, these recommendations to be broad enough uh, that um, they live beyond a couple months, and so I, I'm fine with this change, but I, I think if the longer we discuss this, it seems as though this is kind of growing in terms of 
uh, um, more detailed recommendations, and, and that's what we're here for. I understand that, but uh, I also think a lot of the context of what was discussed is is uh, listed out here if you read it. it. It may not be as direct as some people might like, but I, I do believe a lot of it is there. Great. Thanks, Mike Nystrom. Mike Fermansky. Yeah, I guess my comment was just, um, yeah, there's, there's, I mean, the numbers are what they are. There's no denying that, um, yeah, Ontonagon County and even, you know, our rates here at Elgin Delta are, uh, you know, on the high end. Um, I, I guess I was just saying, you know, we didn't see that in comments. You know, the comments I saw were all, you know, from the public were, you know, all aimed at UPCO. So that's why I brought it up, I guess. Okay. And uh, this is Jen. I think there's been um, the question of um, management and, and owner and uh, ownership is central to that problem because UPCO's also had a lot a lot of change of ownership. It's not just in the one that's currently here, but there's been what two, three in the past ten years. So. Um, the the instability there um, is a question, and maybe one way to frame it is, the, as is pointed out already, that it's the largest and serves um, a, almost the most customers or close to the most customers. So it it, it has drawn particular attention uh, in the question of how we. Um, look at this uh, 15 county region that is you know pretty much entirely separate from the rest of the counties of Michigan and is connected to Mich and is connected to Wisconsin. And that framing I found the, the, just centering first on geography and then on those who are served and then on how um, are the equitable are those costs across our 15 counties. Does that give you enough to work with, Eric? Yeah, so I'm, I think there's enough there to reframe just this intro part um, to reflect the both the comments and this discussion. And are you comfortable with that, Mike Formansky? Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Jen. I think this is definitely making it stronger. I think I'm going to zoom us back out. If that makes sense to folks and if we feel like the discussion here is um, if we're feeling good about the discussion here, um, I'm thinking that, uh, you know. It would be good just to kind of um, I wish we were in the in a room together as opposed to in the virtual room together, but I think I'm going to zoom us back out and just see if there's discussion broad discussion around the recommendations. Um, that anybody wants to have. I think, you know, we spent a lot of time in the last meeting um, and then, you know, with public comments in between these meetings. And uh, I guess I'm I'm curious if you step back, um, if folks are feeling like um, what we've discussed has been reflected in this uh, second report that's in front of you. I wish I could see everyone nodding. <laughs> so I'm going to assume you're virtually nodding. Roman's physically nodding. I can see Roman now. OK. Um, well, you know, let's uh, talk about the path forward from here. And I will say um, part of the reason I'm hesitating a little bit is because we're coming to the end of our road on this. And I'm a bit bummed because we've spent so much time on this work um, and because we've spent so much time together having these discussions. Um, if we aren't having more things that we want to talk about at this point, I'm actually going to open it up for public comment for if we've got, I know we've got one 
individual who's requested to give public comment today and then you know we'll do some closing comments uh unless anyone's got anything any task force members have things they want to talk about now michael larson raised his hand i, I, I just i just just had one more thing on the public comment just that you know just to consider and this was um uh the last two potential recommendations that brad newman actually also suggested about the planning and planning enabling act on whether or not they seem to be reasonable suggestions that went along with some of our planning discussions or uh, and you know if we don't want to necessarily get into you know saying that it should be a use by right but uh maybe at least the, you know the, the the first one where you know all jurisdictions required to adopt master plan suggest that you know they plan for renewable energy within that uh, i just wanted to see if the group or if eric had any thoughts you know on that uh you know whether that would be appropriate kind of given your closeness to the uh document or maybe we maybe you did add those in there no i just pulled up the public comment document oh and sorry this were, is the public yeah comment just so everyone had before them what we were referencing so my only um response to not including these were that they sort of I think maybe more more substantively altered the comments that the task force had created the, um, prior to the public comment period so I think this is definitely the right forum to discuss their inclusion uh, they do sort of fit within the sort of broad outlines of the recommendations that were that are have been written thus far uh, they just however rec would require um, you know in inclusion and so want to get this group to have that discussion um so I'll open up to that yeah and so you, i guess my take on this when we discussed it was um that it did it feels like it's in line with our recommendations but it wasn't squarely in the crosshairs if that made sense and so you know we worked hard in processing public comments to bring things to you and to have a discussion about things that seemed um, in concert with the work we'd already done as opposed to kind of going again it it complements but it felt a little further afield and so we were just trying to trying to measure that so that our work today um, you know could solidly wrap up the the draft report with us all nodding at each other instead of you know branching out too far Yeah, and I, I think I think that's I think that's very fair. Uh, I just wanted to open it up to the group here because I did think you know that there was a a, a very a direct complementary line, uh, you know, into you know planning and zoning here, you know, especially with you know requiring or asking or at least making that consideration uh, in the planning and zoning, uh, you know, or the planning enabling act uh, there to you know make sure that energy generation distribution you know is included you know within those planning purposes there so uh again i'm i'm happy to let it be i just wanted to see if anybody else in the group had had uh, thoughts on it any task members want to speak to amending the planning enabling act or the michigan zoning enabling act Uh, this is Jen. It it seems like, it, of course, it's a statewide issue as well as a, a UP issue, and um, I almost feel like we need like yeah that second tier almost of um, ideas, um, or maybe this would go with the climate solutions group. Would that be a place that this would go? I definitely think it's something that makes sense to be discussed within the work groups at the at the Climate Solutions Council. I'm happy with it. How about we take the task of making sure that it moves over properly? Very good. Okay. Thanks, Thank Michael. You. Anything else anyone wants to raise? OK. Before we move into closing comments, I am going to move us over to public comment. And I know Rich Vanderveen wanted to speak, and then I see horse raised, horse hand is raised as well. Um, so I'm going to go to um, horse first, I guess, because he's got his hand up. Oh, we've got hands up. Okay, we're going to go to uh, Vanderveen first then, and then we'll take the hands that are up, just because Rich uh, wrote in and asked 
So I am setting my timer for three, my trusty timer here set for three minutes. Um, and then we're a little bit ahead of schedule. So I hope that Rich is here and available to talk. I think I saw him on. Okay, okay great. Rich, you may well, okay. unmute and I'm going to hand it off to you for three minutes. All right. Am I un unmuted? Sound great. Okay. Carry on. Uh, Thank you, each and every one of you, for the good hard work you've done, including the uh, modest disagreements I hear from time to time. You all are working hard for the good of the UP. And as, as chairman of the Smart Zone here at, M at NMU, uh, I, I said last week or two weeks ago that don't forget to look for the innovation coming out of the universities, the entrepreneurial thinking, uh, the way in which we, this can drive new growth in the UP. Uh, we are blessed with really bright people. And Marquette likes to say we, we punch above our own weight because we are a small city, but we are making things happen. I also just want to mention that uh, we've been honored uh, by Sands Township and Marquette County for the uh, unanimous approvals of a, a very large solar project. And you'll all be hearing a little bit more about the Superior Solar Project. Uh, we appreciate all the good work you've done, and we think that uh, that project and many others to come will help implement the recommendations of the task force. So thanks again. I look forward to working with each of you, and uh, the door is always open as soon as the COVID coast, COVID coast is clear. Come on up, uh, Lisa, and, and come on over, everybody. We'll have some fun at the uh, Zephyr. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Rich. You'll definitely catch me in Marquette soon. OK, um, I'm going to look and see who's raised their hands. Uh, Horst, would you like to go first? Yes, uh, thank you. Floor is yours. I'm setting my timer. Three minutes. Um, Nystrom's comments about not getting uh, out there in terms of the um, message uh, from our from your report, from your um, yeah. uh, what, what I realize is that we need to have a campaign in order to disseminate the information to the public. And uh, this comes from the fact that I noticed that after the 14 recommendations came out, there was very little that was done you know, to, to disseminate that information, get it out to the public. And um, so I know our, our group, uh, Upper Peninsula Environmental Coalition, had some uh, program, virtual programs where we uh, showed, showed what the um, propane part of, of the uh, report was. So we thought that was, you know, excellent. But I, I think the audience, you know, was extremely limited. And so um, part, part of it, I think, is that um, need to, uh, you know, get um, the key points out. I, th I think there has to be some professional uh, help in terms of uh, public relations, advertising, uh, videography to to make the uh, whole thing more uh, palatable to the public because you're competing against everything else that people are being hit with out there. Um, the uh, other problem is to you know invite um, you know, test, I invite task force members to uh, contact me and, uh, you know, we would be happy to have you on, on one of our programs to, to get the message out here in, in the UP. Um, it, uh, the other part of it is that perhaps the Public Service Commission can also be involved in, in some of this. Um, so, you know, work with, the, work with the media that's out there, um, you know, the you know, the local local TV stations, um, the progressive uh, papers like Michigan Advance or the Bridge Michigan are are two that come to mind, but there are others. And uh, the the other thing is if the if if the what's happening with um, Enbridge and its allies in, in their propaganda campaign is they have to come out with a fact checking type of, of uh, system that you know, put, keeps the uh, uh, what the claims that are made by the side that doesn't want the changes uh, to, you know, overwhelm the me the positive message that you are bringing out. So, so all in all, it's, it's important, I think, just to 
be aware that we've got 10 million people here in Michigan, and we're lucky if we can get 100,000 of them probably to pay attention to the message, and which would probably be an improvement over what we probably are getting now. But I think it's really, really important for, for us to get the message out and, and to, uh, you know, call in the uh, all the environmental organizations. We've got uh, 1,500 of them in the state to see who would be interested in in helping out and as you know an effective campaign such as the uh, line five uh, that's been done by or, the, sorry uh, to interrupt but i'm gonna have to say it's been three minutes so i do appreciate your comments though and appreciate your regular attendance and uh discussion with us okay thank you okay thank you next i've got john o'brien john are you with us yes i am can you hear me Yep, I can hear you. I'm going to go ahead and set my timer and the floor is yours. Okay, well, yeah, thanks everybody. This has been wonderful to sit in and participate. And um, I've had the, the fortune to work with uh, different climate organizations at Northern Michigan University at my last semester there. I'm graduating um, next month. And I've also been working closely with Rich Vanderveen to try to uh, promote this Superior Solar Project. And so I've, I've run some numbers on um, the, the carbon benefits, the climate benefits of the project. And I think uh, you guys received um, that via email. Uh, and so I just wanted to highlight a couple of things in there. Um, so I, I broke down uh, the the carbon reduction from the renewable energy generated at the project. And then I, I quantified, um, you know, the, the price that, that that costs, like the externalities that are, that are imposed on society by the emissions from burning fossil fuels. And, you know, it's important because we're, we're coming into um, a summer where Congress has a, a second chance of passing legislation through reconciliation and it's looking very probable that there will be climate legislation and you know that could be a, a price on carbon and and if it goes the way that that noah kaufman who just joined the biden administration from columbia university if it goes his way he's talking about a 50 dollars a ton carbon price um the biden administration has assigned an internal carbon price on their own operations of $51 a ton. So if, if you assign that $50 a ton to Bordelite and Power um, and Marquette, they would, they would pay an additional 2.4 cents per kilowatt hour when, when they're generating or buying off of MISO um, on average. UPCO is less than that. They're only at 1.8 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and so you know there's there's value to renewable energy in the savings of of carbon um and so i just i i wanted to point that out and then also say that um if i i see that there was a a mention i think of the closed mine solar project in in the report and um you know to be fair i think it would be nice to add after the mention of that, um, you know, however, time is of the essence in the transition to a uh, carbon neutral state of Michigan. And, and with the uncertainties around propane, um, we, sh we recommend that the Superior Solar Project, uh, which is the only large renewable energy project that is fully leased, zoned and permitted, um, you know, receive support in, in whatever way that it can. So just wanted to put that in there. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. All right. I don't have any other individuals for public comment. Kimber, if you have anything else you've received, feel free to let me know. Um, we'll just wait a second and see if there's anybody else who'd like to give comment to the task force. We have not received any other requests through email. Okay. Thanks, Kimber. And I'm just going to say that the fantastic summaries of public comment that you all received, task force members received over email, were put together by Kimber um, to support the fantastic work that the public sector consultants team has done uh, consolidating the recommendations and turning them into uh, a final version of the report. All right, so I'm not seeing any other hands go up. 
Uh, so folks, I think we've come to the end of our journey here together. Um, I hope that this is I hope that this is a harbinger of more work together to do um, to remind you of kind of the logistics of this. The final report is due to the governor March 31. Um, and then the task force dissolves 90 days after the issuance of the final report. So um, we're working the Eagle teams working together with the public sector consultants team to take um, the material um, that we've got and wrap it up and finish it as a as a final task force report. Um, so I guess what I'm going to just say is a few more pieces of gratitude, not only to the Eagle team, certainly Kimber, um, but also James and Brandy and others who have kept us all organized and coordinated. Um, and then as you as I've said a few times, I'm just going to say again how much um, I really appreciate the work of the task force. Um, I do think that this has been really important, thoughtful conversation that has moved um, moved things forward. And while recommendations are recommendations, I look forward to partnering with all of you as we work to um, move move this forward and really make a difference. And I think that this creates um, a nice foundation uh, for continuing the work in the Upper Peninsula. Um, I also want to say a thank you to those that contributed the report and the recommendations through the technical presentations at task forces. So um, while the last few have been a lot of our work and, you know, again, a lot of support from public sector, um, the previous ones, uh, we had a lot of outside stakeholder input and presentations that really supported us crafting uh, those recommendations and that some of that was public sector, some of that was private sector, some of that was NGOs. Um, it was really informative and helpful to get us to the final version of the of the report that we have in front of us. Um, so, you know, I think that our deliberations really made consistently clear for me how important affordable, reliable, secure and environmentally sound solutions are for the Upper Peninsula, as you all know. Um, and I know that the work that's in front of us, um, you know, going forward for the Upper Peninsula isn't easy, but I do think that um, we know hard work and we're all up to the task. And I think that the draft, um, the recommendations that we have in front of us create a really nice foundation and uh, path forward for that work together. So um, I hope this is um, not goodbye forever, but just a so long for now. Um, look for more emails from us as we finish this up and you get the final version um, that we'll deliver then to the governor. Um, and just know that I, I, I am very grateful for your time and energy and um, uh, look forward to working together on other things that can uh, really make a difference. So with that, thank you. I'll miss you all. Let's talk again soon. Thanks much. Thank you, Lisa. Done an amazing job. Thanks all. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Been an honor. Been an honor. Thank you very much.